All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The House is adjourned. That's the sound of Missouri's 2016 legislative session officially coming to a close in mid-May. Papers are being tossed in the air. There's handshakes, pats on the back. Maybe even a couple hugs. Hey, everybody, it's me, Camille. And me, Tim. And here are some of the big accomplishments lawmakers in Jefferson City, Missouri's capital, completed by the time they finished their session just a couple of days ago on May 13th. They passed some new ethics rules, submitted a budget earlier than usual. And they changed the rules for school funding, not by giving schools more money, but by saying the state should be giving schools less money. But for many people, there's a big hole in that legislative rundown. Less than two years ago, protests put the national and international spotlight on the St. Louis suburb of Ferguson. At the time, many observers thought state lawmakers would pass bills that deal with some of the underlying issues brought to light by those protests. And they have passed a couple of laws, but critics say there's a lot more lawmakers could have done to help bridge deep racial fault lines in the state's largest metro area. Which is begs the question, how did we get here? <sighs> That's a long story. That's true. So on this episode, we hand things over to a good friend who has spent nearly two years following that story from the streets of Ferguson to the State House. We live here. We live here. We live here. We live here. A project exploring race, class, power, poverty, systems, and the people, people they, they touch. touch. I'm Tim Lloyd. And I'm Camille Stanley. And from St. Louis Public Radio, this is We Live Here. All right, so we're here in our studios at St. Louis Public Radio. And joining us is our buddy and crack political reporter, Jason Rosenbaum. Hey, Jason. Hey, guys. And shameless plug, Jason hosts a great podcast about Missouri politics called Politically Speaking. Indeed, I do. Yeah, and everybody should go listen to that podcast. So if you want to do that, go subscribe at iTunes or find it at stlpublicradio.org. But guys, we're not here for seamless cross-promotion of St. Louis Public Radio's bevy of audio offerings. No. No, we are not. Yeah, actually, we asked you to the studio to tell us a story about where things stand when it comes to state policy and all the issues brought to light by Ferguson. And given that you're such a nice guy and Tim and I are super persuasive. Super persuasive. You agree. I did. So I started going back through all the tape and notes I've collected over since, I don't know, summer of 2014. Oh, my goodness. That's got to be a lot of material. A lot of stuff. It was. And given everything that's happened, where are we starting this story then? Well, I was thinking about this dreary Monday. Monday night a few months ago in St. Louis, I was out covering the last meeting of the Ferguson Commission. Oh, the Ferguson Commission. They, they released the big report of, with a bunch of policy recommendations after Michael Brown's death. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. And in these dwindling moments of the group's final meeting, people were giving their final reflections on a year-long public policy odyssey aimed at changing St. Louis. Now, at, at this point, most of the crowd had filtered out. And I was about to join them, to be honest. These types of statements aren't the type of thing that I would usually put in a story, Mm -hmm. which is why I unplugged my tape recorder. I don't know whether it was instinct or happenstance, but I plugged my tape recorder back in when Ferguson Commission co-chairman Starsky Wilson started speaking. So tonight we're pleased to be a part of this process, but this is just ground beef. We get to the real work, we get to the real victories, when we can say, when we continue to count down that these policy recommendations have been implemented, that people who have been elected, the people who are our true leaders in this community, who have their hands on the levers of power, are champions for this kind of positive change. Most of my job as a political reporter involves listening to lots and lots of talking. Some addresses I hear are really good, others not so much. But Wilson's comments stuck with me, especially when he issued a direct challenge to the state's elected officials. Until they ask, how can I serve you? They've not engaged in the kind of subversion that's required to heal our community and get us to true reconciliation and take us down a path toward equity. Tell me where you stand and where you've stood as our community dealt with our burning hearts, our burning desires, and our burning buildings. It was an incredible speech, but I was a little skeptical. As someone who went to a lot of Ferguson Commission meetings, I can tell you all about how many people provided their input and guidance. But I had to wonder if political will would go away as Brown's death faded into memory. And I also wondered if the politicians he was calling out would listen to him. And after the speech, I put that question to Wilson. 
Do you have confidence that the people that want to be our statewide leaders are going to listen to what you just said? Or do you think they're going to fall into very similar patterns that other candidates have by, you know, being law and order candidates or saying all these policy proposals aren't worth doing? Like, what, what's kind of your feeling on that? I place my confidence in the 2,200 people who are part of this process. I place my confidence in the 1,400 people who came out to public accountability meetings in the month of November. Uh, I believe that an engaged, mobilized community of people who are affected by policy uh, can best hold elected officials, civic leaders accountable, uh, and those are the people to put their trust in. But there's some important context behind what Wilson told me. At the time, it had been 485 days since Brown's shooting death, which is why I'm going to push rewind and take you guys back to August of 2014, just days after Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson fatally shot Brown. You know, Jason, I think a lot of people outside of St. Louis, that particular period in time will conjure up images of tear gas canisters, uh, big protests, and at times just chaos. And I remember all of that, too. Mm -hmm. But I also remember voices like Bishop Derek Robinson. I first met him across the street from the Ferguson Police Department. He was there with several other protesters who believed Brown's death prompted a closer examination into St. Louis's soul. And this is something that has, has brewed on the fire for such so long. And so now is the opportunity for them to speak and speak now. In the weeks after protests began in earnest, I talked to lots of people on sidewalks, in parking lots, in front of churches and businesses. In these sweltering summer hours, I heard story after story from black St. Louisans about their bad interactions with law enforcement. They spoke of disrespect, dehumanization, and for Anthony Ross, a searing detachment. Well, there's always been a sense of disconnect between the police and not just people of color, but people in general. People, as people, we've never felt respected by them on any level because before we, before we get the opportunity to even express ourselves, we're already deemed to be quiet, don't say anything to we already, they're abrasive as soon as, as soon as they see us. Some people also told me they had terrible experiences within St. Louis County's large web of municipal courts. And it wasn't just Ferguson, which has just one of the 80-something courts in the region. St. Louis area residents like Meldon Moffitt felt like other cities in the county saw him as a stack of money, as opposed to a human being. Ferguson ain't the only district that's doing it. All of them are doing it. Yeah. County as well, all of them. I mean... If you pull me up for a traffic ticket and you catch me doing the wrong and I get a ticket, I can deal with that. But if you pull me over and assuming I did something wrong and you give me a traffic ticket and I can't prove my innocence, what am I to do? I can't beat them. It's my word against theirs and they're going to take their word over mine because they carry their badge and they're the protectors of the law. Through these conversations, it was painfully obvious that there was a serious divide between elected leaders that drive policy and the people they represent. Travis Sowell told me he had never interacted much with a politician before Brown's death. But that changed when State Senator Maria Chappelle Nadal spent time with the protesters. She had came and uh, spent the night with us and actually got to talk to us and figure out what, what do we want, what are our demands, how do we feel, and just really just chilling with one another. And that's, I say that's the most important thing. That's the first step you have to go to because this is the community that you're supposed to be serving. If you don't know your people, who the hell are you serving but yourself and getting your, or getting your bank account set up for the rest of your life? Eventually, the summer heat faded away, and so did the international spotlight on St. Louis. And the same people who told me their stories expected lawmakers to act when they returned to the state capitol in Jefferson City. Take Senator Maria Chappelle Nadal, the lawmaker that hung out with protesters. If you've known her as long as I have, she went through a pretty big philosophical transformation after Ferguson. Before Brown's death, Chappelle Nadal was usually not critical about how law enforcement went about its business. But after the unrest, Chappelle Nadal filed legislation to appoint a special prosecutor whenever there's a police-involved killing, a demand made by many protesters, but not a favorite among police unions. She also advocated for police body cameras and limits for when police can use tear gas. I mean, you know, you try being tear gas for three hours and see how you feel about that. I mean, it's traumatizing. It truly is, and I have a lot of guts. But let me tell you, not that night. I didn't. Not that night. 
Just before lawmakers got back to work in 2015, Chappelle Nadal told me that police officers had mishandled the aftermath of Michael Brown's shooting death. Instead of coming at protesters with batons and tear gas, Chappelle Nadal said they should have brought social workers and grief counselors. The biggest impediment in this whole ordeal is the lack of communication and the lack of understanding of the, cor- the, the cultural norms in this type of community. And Chappelle Nadal wasn't alone. There were lots of lawmakers in St. Louis pushing for policy changes after Ferguson. Democratic State Representative Clem Smith co-sponsored a number of bills overhauling how law enforcement operated. He lives in Velda Village Hills, a tiny city in North St. Louis County. Police in that area are notorious for aggressively ticketing black motorists. Smith told me this story about going to court for what he thought was a questionable traffic violation. I don't know if you've ever witnessed the lines in some of these municipalities on uh, court night. Uh, It's almost like a Six Flags ride. I mean, they to the point where people are like kind of snaking, trying to get into a small courtroom in order to uh, see the prosecutor and the judge or, or, or pay their fines. So uh, just out of convenience in, instead of trying to, to fight it, because I believe there was some, some room there to uh, actually fight some of the charges. I just paid the money. I, I, so the system beat me down and I, and I forked up the cash. Smith could afford to pay the fines, especially since he splits his professional time between the Missouri House and his job at Boeing. But some of his constituents aren't as lucky as he represents some poor parts of St. Louis County. He clearly thought the region's municipal courts needed to change, and back in late 2014, Smith felt Republicans that control the General Assembly would take things seriously. This traffic issue or bringing up these diversity numbers within these uh Municipal police departments has put a stain on Missouri, unfortunately. Uh, In my travels, I've been to a few conferences in the last few weeks in Ferguson, in the police, law enforcement, lack of diversity comes up all the time. There were GOP lawmakers who were willing to act. During the protest, Senator Bob Dixon drove 225 miles from his Springfield home to the city of Ferguson. I caught up with him the following spring during the legislative session. At the time, the DOJ had just released its scathing report about Ferguson's court and police system. This is incomprehensible to see this depth of problems, and it would begin to answer some of the questions that Missourians in other parts of the state have been asking. Why are the people so angry? I think we need to dive in and and make sure we really address these issues, because uh, that's what That's what we're supposed to be here for. The number one issue for Republicans like Dixon was going after municipalities they derided as speed traps are dependent on fine revenue. You know, Jason, I remember that. And I got to tell you, it wasn't really at the time that shocking of a political stance. Yeah, I mean, it's not like it's an act of blazing political courage to point the finger at another politician. Right, right. But there was a subtle reluctance to embrace substantial changes to how police officers were trained or how they do their jobs. Like the Democrats from St. Louis were asking for. Exactly. For instance, then-House Speaker John Deal, a Republican from a wealthy suburb in St. Louis, was pessimistic that anything would get done. I think it's a mistake going into the General Assembly in general or at the beginning of a session saying, here's a Ferguson solution. I mean, because let's be realistic. You know, the the things that happen in Ferguson, there's not a law you can point to that if it were changed or something were done differently, that would have avoided what happened. So here's where I'm going to pick the story back up. During most of the 2015 session, lawmakers spent a lot of time ironing out the kinks of a bill widely known as Senate Bill 5. It changed the way how municipal courts are supposed to act, and it limited how much money those little cities could keep from traffic fines. For St. Louis County municipalities, the cap was 12.5 percent. For the rest of the state, 20 percent. But as the municipal governance overhaul sailed through, I watched as other Ferguson-related bills languished. Body camera legislation stalled out. Efforts to bolster police sensitivity training went nowhere. And getting rid of an unconstitutional use of force statute? Even that didn't happen. These developments clearly bothered lawmakers like State Representative Tommy Pearson. Ferguson is one of the biggest issues in this state, not only the state but the nation. 
and this House leadership has decided not to deal with it at all. I think that's a travesty. At the risk of coming off as totally rude, uh, Camille and I are going to briefly interrupt Jason's story and give you a national perspective. Because even though not a lot was going on here in Missouri, other states were making a lot of changes. Yeah, for instance, Illinois and Maryland, which both have Republican governors, established databases tracking police shootings. New Jersey and Montana restricted the transfer of military-style weapons to local police departments. Even Texas managed to pass a law that gave grants to local police agencies to pay for body cameras. Yeah, I feel like there should be a record scratch here. Did you you just say Texas? I did. You said Texas. I said Texas. All right. But again, it wasn't the only state that was doing things. Colorado also passed a bunch of bills. John Cook is a Republican state senator in Colorado, and he says the events in Ferguson showed a need for pragmatism. And we went to the DA's association and we said, look, Law enforcement has taken a beating. And they said, look, we can't just sit back and say no. We realize we, you know, have to work and and, uh, make things, you know, uh, look better and um, and be proactive on some of these bills. So, Jason, if these policy changes can pass elsewhere, all types of states, red states, blue states, purple states, why couldn't they pass in Missouri? I mean, you would think with all the media attention and activism – it would prompt lawmakers here to act. That's a reasonable assumption, Mm. but there's a combination of obstacles at play here. For one thing, the legislature often moves at a very, very slow (laughs) pace. Yeah, I mean, it can take years for a bill to even get a vote, let alone pass. And that's true. But when I talked with Democratic State Representative Michael Butler in the summer of 2015, he pointed to two big reasons why the General Assembly didn't act. The first was a bit of political pragmatism. Butler thought that GOP lawmakers wanted to gain a foothold with traditionally Democratic police unions. Here's what Butler says is reason number two. They're not willing to act on uh, African-American issues. Uh, Let's be honest, the Ferguson issue really is a black issue. It's a racial issue. And it it says that our legislature and and Republican leadership does not want to act uh, for black Missourians when Uh, Folks bring up race and bring up some glaring issues when it comes to just cultural differences. Even if you use the word cultural differences, Republicans have been known to say we want to keep that out of it. We want to keep that out of it. I think folks in Missouri, it's it's not just just, just legislators. Folks in Missouri are afraid to have the race conversation. Um, Even in the St. Louis area, we're afraid to talk about race. And uh, it won't go away by just not doing it, by doing nothing. It won't go away by not talking about it. As a society and as a culture as a whole, we've had difficulty in dealing with race issues and talking about race issues. I felt compelled to play Butler's clip to the new Speaker of the House, Republican Todd Richardson of Poplar Bluff. The implication um, that uh, the legislature didn't pass a certain subset of bills because of race or because of some sort of underlying racism is flatly wrong. Um, and despite the fact that I like Representative Butler very much, we have a good relationship, I think his characterization's way off base. Richardson said every Ferguson-related bill had an opportunity to pass. Many of them received hearings but ran into philosophical and logistical opposition. For instance, there was a lot of agreement that equipping police with body cameras was a good idea, but lots of people didn't agree on whether to make the footage public. Richardson also added that it was a mistake to treat a post-Ferguson policy push It's just about law enforcement. The reality is there are things we can do in the law enforcement space that that makes sense to do. No question about it. But if if we allow that to dominate the conversation, we're missing the broader economic and educational issues that exist, not just in Ferguson, but in places across the state. So, Jason, I'm listening to you tell us this story. And I just want to be fair and mention that the Missouri State Legislature did pass something in 2015, that bill cracking down on how much municipalities can take in from traffic fine revenue. Yeah, that's the one that everybody around here calls SB5 for short. That's the one, and there's no question it was a significant achievement. In fact, some would say it's the only public policy change of note that came after Michael Brown's death. And we should also note that many supportive politicians say it addresses at least one root cause of tension between many African Americans and law enforcement. It does, but I also noticed that a lot of black lawmakers voted against the bill, including Clem Smith. Wait, isn't that the guy from Boeing, the guy who told us all about how crazy these municipal courts are? It's the same guy. 
I mean, but wouldn't he be for this bill then, especially if it helped the poor people that he represents? You would think so, but this is the reason he gave me about why he voted against the bill. It was something that was going to impact communities that did not have a, you know, in quote, Ferguson situation going down. There are some reforms in the bill that I, that I actually do like, but there should be equal treatment of 20 percent across the board. Uh, but this is a, a poor excuse. If, if one would want to use this as an excuse to... Uh, you know, something we did in Ferguson, it is not. Like other Democratic lawmakers, Smith didn't like how St. Louis County had a different fine cap than the rest of the state. But there was something else about the law that seemed particularly bothersome. From looking at the numbers, the new law would be a huge blow for cities with African-American populations and black elected leadership. Some of those towns had clearly engaged in indefensible practices, but others felt that they were being painted with a broad brush. Here's what Normandy Mayor Patrick Green told me in late 2015. The stereotyping is what hurts the African-American community. And I said it. It's like saying all black people eat chicken and watermelon. So when we go to Applebee's, what does the restaurant, like you said, uh, waiter ask? Do you want chicken and watermelon? Well, guess what? It's insulting to imply we're all alike. It's insulting. I don't care if that comes from even our own African-American community and leadership or from whites. And Green was so adamantly opposed to this new law that he joined a group of mostly black mayors that took the state to court to block it. And we'll have more on that lawsuit in just a little bit. But Jason, I remember you writing a bunch of other stories around this time on another concern that many black elected officials had when it came to SB5. Yeah, something about this this chain reaction people were worried about. Mm -hmm. A domino effect, if you will. And it's a little complicated, so I thought I would break it down as simply as I possibly can. If they didn't have this fine revenue, many of these cities would go bankrupt. If these cities go bankrupt and dissolved, they would be absorbed by St. Louis County. Ah, okay. So they get absorbed by the county, which we know is mostly white, meaning that these cities would no longer have black political representation. Exactly. And if I could keep you all in the public policy weeds a little bit longer, Mm -hmm. there was another big complaint. Wealthy suburbs may get more money in fines than poorer black-run cities, but it was already a smaller percentage of their overall budget, so it would just be business as usual for them. So basically harder on poor municipalities and really no big deal for wealthy municipalities? Is yeah, that, yeah. Okay. That, that was it. And I brought these concerns up to supporters of the new law, like St. Louis Treasurer Tashara Jones. We weren't meant to hold these positions for a lifetime. And what are you doing in that position to make people's lives better? And we saw that time after time that the municipalities run by either either whites or blacks were gouging people's incomes on minor traffic violations. And that's wrong. That's simply wrong. We have to find a way to structure our tax system uh, to make sure that um, that we take care of the basic needs of government. So you get the point. There's been a lot of back and forth about the one state policy change directly related to the Ferguson unrest. But remember that lawsuit? In late March of this year, a Cole County judge gutted most of the new law. It raised the traffic fine limit in St. Louis County from 12.5 percent to 20 percent of a city's budget. And Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, though, the uh, state is appealing that decision, right? They are. Mm -hmm. But if that ruling is upheld, the Missouri legislature will have accomplished almost none of the big public policy goals directly related to the Ferguson unrest. But the key word there is almost. During the final days of the Missouri General Assembly's 2016 session, the one that just ended a few days ago, lawmakers did end up passing several bills that fit the Ferguson-related mold. They finally got rid of that unconstitutional statute that lays out how police can use deadly force. They also made it harder for cities to keep non-traffic fine revenue, such as housing code violations. For the sake of clarity, this is different from the traffic fine bill, which again was struck down by a judge. I caught up with State Senator Eric Schmidt in the Senate side gallery. The Republican told me that lawmakers have listened to the people. The the reforms last year and this year are us listening to people on the ground and understanding that there's a great deal of um, um, desire to have some significant reforms as it relates to local governments. And so, um, and again, a lot of of local governments, a lot of cities are are doing things the right way, but there are some that continue to view people as ATMs and, um, and that kind of abuse has to end. But legislators like Democratic State Representative Rochelle Walton Gray aren't buying into that kind of rhetoric. 
The lawmaker from North St. Louis County sponsored a long list of bills aimed at changing how law enforcement officials are trained. As she talked to me near the floor of the Missouri House, Walton Gray felt that her colleagues were dancing around larger issues. They wanted to be able to say they did something, so I guess they focused on municipal court reform. But uh, we have to deal with the issue of biases in the police force. And I do want to say, though, I, I think that our police officers do a good job, and I think that we need to have mutual respect for one another. So it's, it's two-sided. But the police and practices bills um, wanted to, want, they dealt with cultural competency. And just having more of an um, indication of your biases. You may not feel that you're biased or anything, but you, everybody is. So the legislature did pass some things this year that moved the public policy needle a bit. But the larger post-Ferguson policy agenda from education to economics still hasn't gained full traction in the state capitol. And it's clear that new political leaders will have to do the heavy lifting for any of those changes to take shape on a statewide level. But are politicians actually willing to do the work to make these things happen? Well, let's just take the people who want to run this state. There's a gubernatorial race going on this year that's wide open since there's no incumbent. I talked to the five major candidates, and none of them seemed ready to embrace dramatic policy changes. Take a listen to Republican Peter Kinder, Eric Greitens, and Catherine Hannaway, and Democrat Chris Coster. The clear message is Missourians are demanding a return to law and order. One of the things that we have to do very clearly is we have to demonstrate our police officers have our support. I disagree with some of the expanded social services proposed by the report. And that kind of absolute loyalty uh, to law enforcement has been a, a hallmark of my professional life for 20 years. After the Ferguson Commission issued its final report, it dissolved at the beginning of 2016. And it was never charged with following through on any of its recommendations, which was always a source of contention and criticism. But there was more to the commission's final meeting besides Wilson's speech. So lest somebody tell you that the report is dusty on a shelf, it is definitely not. Nicole Hudson runs a nonprofit group called Forward Through Ferguson, which was set up to carry on the commission's work. I have seen over the last year this region be ready and open to things that it wasn't before. And so whether that is a moral imperative that people have kind of awoken, um, whether that's people who have been doing this work forever and who were tired and who are now re-energized, or whether that's people who are just, you know, worried about their bottom line and worried about reputation, we have a real opportunity and a real window. And I would encourage anyone who feels as though um, nothing's going to happen and the report is on a shelf, um, my friends and family and the, the friends and family, the other people who are close to working on this could tell you that there is plenty of work going on. Hudson says St. Louis doesn't have to wait around for lawmakers to do something. They can make changes on their own. And as I've spent nearly two years following this story, I've always wondered whether new laws or regulations were the answer. And all the initiatives in the world won't matter if our schools are still segregated and we hold on to longstanding prejudices about race and class. As a parent of a precocious two-year-old, I have a vested interest in where we go from here. I want my son to grow up in a St. Louis that values racial equity and abhors segregation of all kinds. Some of that will require people to change their preconceived attitudes, and laws can't do that alone. But history shows they can play a part. And after everything I've seen, I'm confident that the path ahead won't be easy, or immediate, or without turmoil. But you know what? St. Louis's future will depend on what we do next. So if you like Jason's story and you like the kind of reporting that we do here at We Live Here, be sure to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're listening to us on iTunes, click that five-star review. Please. Five stars. Please. <laughs> also, uh, if you're one of our good friends listening on NPR One, thanks. 
uh, click that interesting button. That really helps us out or share it with your friends. Speaking of sharing, come hang out with us on Twitter. We're at We Live Here STL. And all of our back content, including stories and photos and graphics, and of course, all our podcasts, are at our website, We Live Here. Show. And We Live Here is produced by me, Tim Lloyd. And me, Camille Stanley. Sheila Newman is our editor. And Cassie Morgan composed our theme music. And from St. Louis Public Radio, this is We Live Here. Support for this podcast comes from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. From PRX.